PHMSA webinar on tank car non-destructive testing. Uh, my name is Eamon Patrick. I am a transportation specialist in the PHMSA Office of Hazardous Material Safety, Standards, and Rulemaking Division, and uh, I'll be facilitating the meeting today. Uh, so first, I'd like to cover the meeting ground rules. So this presentation is being recorded, and it may be posted online to allow further viewing by interested parties who are not able to attend today. All participants in the meeting are going to be muted throughout. Uh, questions will be addressed at the end of the presentation, time permitting. If you have questions during the presentation, and we certainly anticipate that you will, uh, please type your question into the chat field, and I will collect them for the question and answer period. Uh, particularly complex or specific questions may need to be discussed offline or after the meeting. Um, in addition to the tank car owners, manufacturers, facilities, and shippers represented here today, I would especially like to extend a welcome to representatives from the National Transportation Safety Board. Uh, PHMSA and FRA are here today to provide information on tank car non-destructive testing in response to NTSB safety recommendation R19-3, issued after a DOT 105 tank car ruptured after loading in New Martinsville, West Virginia, releasing the full load of chlorine and forcing thousands of residents to evacuate or shelter in place. NTSB concluded that the prob probable cause of the chlorine release was an undetected pre-existing crack near the inboard end of the stub sill cradle pad that propagated to failure with the changing tank shell stresses during the thermal equalization of the car after loading with low temperature chlorine. This accident reminds us that although the overwhelming majority of shipments reach their destination without incident, Transporting hazardous materials in tank cars can present substantial risks to lives and the environment. A properly implemented non-destructive testing program is a crucial part of reducing the risks associated with tank car transportation. I will now turn the microphone over to FRA's Larry Strauss for our presentation on tank car non-destructive testing. Lawrence H. Strauss, PE, is a general engineer, hazardous materials packaging with the Federal Railroad Administration, U.S. Department of Transportation, specializing in the design, manufacture, maintenance, and quality assurance of tank cars and tank car facilities. Larry's 40 years of experience in the rail industry began as a co-op engineering student with the Electromotive Division of General Motors, then as the manager, quality assurance and welding engineering with GATX, followed by director of engineering with GE Rail Services, and for the past 15 years with FRA. Larry has been active in the American Welding Society as a Senior Certified Welding Inspector, AWS Certified Welding Engineer, AWS D15.1 Railroad Welding Committee Member, and is an ASNT Certified Level 3 in six NDT methods. Holds an ASQ certification as Quality Auditor, Quality Engineer, Mechanical Inspector, Quality and Operational Excellence Manager and Reliability Engineer, and is a Registered Professional Engineer. Larry holds undergraduate and graduate degrees in metallurgy, mechanical engineering, finance, operations management, non-destructive evaluation, and paralegal studies. Larry, the floor is yours for the presentation. Well, thank you, Eamon. I hope I can live up to that bio today. Uh, good morning, everyone. Glad to see that everyone is in attendance, and we had a, a good turnout for this presentation. Today's presentation will cover DOT's response to NTSB recommendation R19003, resulting from a failed tank car, a DOT 105J500W in New Martinsville, West Virginia, that released 178,000 pounds of chlorine. Here's a little bit of the index of what we're covering today. As Eamon mentioned, if any questions arise in your mind, we're going to have a a brief five minute break at around the slide 21 point so that you can formulate some questions if you choose to send them to Eamon and then we can respond to them at the conclusion of today's presentation. Okay, so what caused the chlorine release in New Martinsville in August of 2016? Here's a description or a presentation of the overall situation in New Martinsville on that day. The tank car AXLX1702 was shown. This one is in a in a holding area after the car was loaded. And this is the picture on the right is a 
a picture of what it looked like across the Ohio River from the New Martinsville uh, facility after the car released. NTSB concluded that the DOT 105J500W tank car fracture and release was due in part to one, the propagation of an undetected pre-existing crack near the inboard or the A6 end of the stub sill cradle pad, a known crack prone location on the ACF 200 stub sill design. By the way, this car was manufactured in 1979 and initially sold to PPG, uh, who then subsequently sold it to Axial. The ACF 200 design was an approved design at that time, but had not been uh, designed to meet the requirements of the million mile underframe, which came out about 10 years later. NTSB concluded that one of the causal factors was equalization of stresses in the area of the pre-existing crack due to the cooling of the tank after introduction of the liquid chlorine. The uncontrolled post-weld heat treatment practices that were invoked after some corrosion weld repairs in the tank. An insufficiently frequent stub sill inspection interval that failed to detect the crack and yes, the use of non-normalized steel. At the time the tank con was constructed, uh, in 1979, there were no rules mandating the use of normalized tank car shell steel, which came out in 1989. So at that time, tank cars were free to be manufactured from the non-normalized TC-128 used in this car. The essence of their recommendation is this. They suggested that DOT issue maintenance guidance to owners of DOT 105 pressure tank cars transporting PIH and TIH hazardous materials with risk factors such as non-normalized steel tank shell material or post-weld heat treatment near the stub sill attachment and other high stress locations which one, establish structural integrity inspection frequency. Two, provide guidance for defining critical flaw size and repair and acceptance criteria for indications in fracture sensitive locations. And three, provide guidance for selecting NDT methods to identify cracks with a sufficient probability of detection. Let's look at some synergies among the other transportation modes under the DOT umbrella. In 1988, Aloha Airlines had a catastrophic release of the forward section of the fuselage, sweeping one flight attendant to their death and giving an interesting view of the water to several of the window passenger seats. The middle picture is a 111 tank car that fractured completely circumferentially due to a pre-existing crack in the bottom of the car. In the bottom of the car is now one of the regulated areas that are required to be looked at every time a tank car goes in for qualification and maintenance. And third, the third picture on the right is a recent aircraft engine failure on a Boeing 777, which happened in flight. So this picture was taken when the plane landed at the maintenance depot, but there were several passengers who took uh, videos with their, cam with their telephone cameras to underscore the severity of this incident. Uh, by the way, the engine actually was on fire on the wing and caused considerable alarm among the passengers. Based on the engine incident, the head of the FAA at that time, uh, Mr. Dixon, said that based on initial information, we concluded that the inspection interval should be stepped up, in other words, shortened for the hollow fan blades that were used solely on the Boeing 777 airplanes. And in other words, this is a syn uh, synonymous situation to what we have with the Axial car in that the inspection frequency used in that case were 10 year intervals, insufficient to detect a pre-existing fatigue crack that propagated to failure. The history of these pre-existing cracks goes back Oh, probably since the time I've been in the industry, since at least 1986 and slightly before. 
in the NTSB Special Inspection Report 9205, they said tests and visual inspections at arbitrary intervals, and this was uh, when the hydro test and visual inspection requirements were in place, are not effective to detect defects at high stress areas where stub sills or other components are attached to tanks before sudden and complete failure. So let's look at a summary of some of those defects that occurred and some of the catastrophic failures that occurred, uh, which promulgated NTSB's report. The Union Tank Car, Kettle Falls, Washington failure, Conoco, Dragon, Mississippi failure, which was a uh, significant crack about 60 inches long in the bottom of a 112 J340 car in LPG service. GATX bar cars. GATX anti-shift brackets, which occurred before my time at GATX and uh, was one of the reasons why GATX came out with their uh, NDT personnel qualification and certification program in 1986. Old World Glycol, which had a failure similar to the one we'll discuss today. North American Tank Car Corporation, NATX, inboard cradle pad. Procore, the sump and the anti-shift bracket also. Richmond built brake lever pad failures. ACF 200, A1 and A6 and sump failures, and the list goes on. Here are some pictures and a presentation of where the cracks initiated on this car. There was a pre-existing crack. You can see a slight dimple in there. The crack in this case is about 0.7 inches long that occurred at the inboard A6 termination weld. Uh, in this case, the A left weld, which wraps slightly around the, the corner of the taper on the stub sill cradle pad. Uh, at the time of the NTSB investigation, they detected this pre-existing crack as well as some cracks underneath the stub sill cradle pad. One thing to remember whenever a tank car facility or the owner is specifying what NDT method to use is, always expect the unexpected. And in this case, there were some cracks that actually ran underneath the cradle pad, which would have been invisible to the NDT method used in this case, visual inspection. Here's another view of where the uh, tank cracks initiated and the structure and the layout of the A6 weld and the stub sill cradle pad on the ACF 200 design tank car. In 2012, a new regulation came out, HM 216B. HM 216B changed the paradigm from all totally tank car facility generated procedures and qualification practices to one that is initiated, developed, and managed and monitored by the tank car owner. We flipped the level of responsibility around from the tank car facility to the tank car owner. We also changed the, the way tank cars were inspected and the frequency of those inspections. We transitioned from a regulatory maximum, which were usually 10 years except in corrosive service for thick, for thickness tests and for some service equipment, to a data-driven intervals. In other words, the 10-year interval was still valid if the owner of the tank car, service equipment, or interior coating and lining could demonstrate by collected and analyzed data that a 10-year interval was satisfactory. And we'll talk about reliability in a minute. But in some cases, the some of the people on this phone call now know that they have changed their inspection intervals from the regulatory maximums to what their data and analysis could validate. This is an area where FRA is exerting more effort, both in the initial proactive stance where we have interviews with car owners and we tell them what the requirements are and what we expect to see of them to after incident investigations where we ask the owners for their data and their analysis to prove that the intervals that are on the car will prevent any type of leakage from occurring. We'll talk more about failure in a second. Uh, this uh, is a regulatory 
requirement that the owners of tank car service equipment and interior coatings and linings are obligated to provide that information, both the data and the procedures they use to collect and analyze the data to the FRA or an authorized representative. By the way, HM216B took effect July 25th, 2012. So it's been out there almost nine years. And some folks have told us they didn't understand the regulation or they were not configured to be able to comply with the regulation. In other words, having data forms and data collection analysis and qualification procedures to collect this data. Uh, <laughs> so we find that a little bit disingenuous that the rule's been out there nine years. We've had interviews with a number of people and we've made this and similar presentations to the industry at industry events. So for those folks who are on this call who may not directly manage their fleets, but will be held responsible if an incident occurs, we ask you to go back and research your, uh, maybe research your contracts, your business contracts with your maintenance providers to be sure that it fully complies with the federal regulations. Let's talk about reliability, and that's one of my, my pet interests. HMB 216B, as I said, changed the paradigm, and we talk about now a design level of reliability and safety. So in other words, owners must develop the qualification and maintenance programs, QMPs, that maintain the tank car or components at the design level of reliability and safety. By the way, it is permissible for a tank car service equipment or interior coating or lining owner to use procedures developed by a third party under some type of contractual obligation. But either way, whether the owner develops these procedures themselves with their own staff or whether they contract with a third party, the owners are held responsible for compliance with the federal regulations. And we can talk a little bit more about that. We have a definition in the 49 CFR Part 180, 503, where we talk about reliability is the quantified ability of a tank car or component to operate without failure for its design life or next qualification. And we'll show you a slide of that in a minute. So by transposing some of these terms, we, we can see that the design level of reliability and safety is the quantified ability of a tank car or a component to operate without failure for its design life or next qualification. As an engineer, I'm always accustomed to inserting one formula into another one to come up with the equation that I think is applicable to certain uh, design types and design situations. So I did a little bit of transposing here to, to relate some of the definitions in 18503. I highlighted the word quantified because quantified means a numerical value. In other words, the owner, if they use a reliability assessment, as we talk about in, in further in the presentation, they will need to come up with a numerical value for what their fleet reliability must be. We'll talk about that. Therefore, that qualification decal on the side of the car means that the procedures that were used to qualify the car must be adequate to prevent no failures over this interval. And in this case, FRA defines a failure as a hazmat release. We'll talk more about how owners can define failures further on. The transition from the regulatory maximum intervals to reliability-based intervals is based on reliability and reliability statistics and numerical values. So for those people who are um, new to the reliability discussion, maybe have not heard prior reliability presentations from FRA, you know that when you qualify the tank, as in this example, that means all of the welds that are covered by the tank qualification 18509, meaning the girth seam welds, the longitudinal seam welds in the tank in the bottom four feet of the tank shell, as well as all of the attachment welds, longitudinal fillets at the termination points, and the complete length of the transverse fillet welds for fillets greater than quarter of an inch, according to the drawing specification. 
for some car designs, that's quite a large number of welds. And part of the certificate of construction package that must be submitted to the F, to the AAR for approval is a qualification drawing showing the owners where the car was inspected at time of construction and where the owners should look when they perform the recurrent qualifications. Here are some examples of the, the CFR 18509E1 and E4 talk about each tank our owner must develop a QMP, Qualification and Maintenance Program, which ensures a tank car facility inspects and tests the structural elements identified in E1 by either dye penetrant, radiography, magnetic particle, ultrasonic, and or direct remote or enhanced visual inspection using magnifiers, fiberscopes, borescopes, or machine vision technology. This is a this is a point that we are very vigilant about. When you're going to use visual inspection, the area under scrutiny must be clean, and it must be clean sufficient to detect cracks that would appear. And what we have found in our facility audits is either the tank car owner does not clearly specify how clean is clean in their procedures, or the facility technicians fail to clean it, sufficiently to detect cracks. Um, so the use of direct remote or enhanced visual inspection is part of the regulation and should be included in the NDT technician's kit, his toolbox of NDT tools. So you have to perform these inspections unless the owner can determine by finite element analysis, damage tolerance analysis, or a service reliability assessment that the tank car or component will not develop defects that reduce the design level of reliability and safety or fail over its design life or qualification interval. Remember, that's what that decal on the side of the car said. That's a federal, uh, that's a federally mandated activity that must occur. By the way, if anyone performs what we used to call pencil whipping inspections and tests where they fail to do it, but they certify that it has been done, that is a federal violation it is subject to civil and criminal penalties and the inspector general's office is very interested in any cases that we can find where that has occurred. All right, let's talk about what the three elements of a uh, alternative inspection program are. Finite element, FEA. Most of you who are tank car manufacturers use this liberally throughout the design of your car. It's a way to determine the stresses on a tank car from a set of uh, load inputs to ensure that they will perform without failure using defined loads, desi design sub-elements, material properties, and analytical load to stress formulae. There are some software packages that can do that for you. The AAR has been kind enough to develop a set of load data that they give to the industry uh, called repost data that then can be incorporated into a finite element analysis to come up with a theoretical stress at a particular structurally sensitive location on the car. Damage tolerance analysis is a way to determine the length of time a tank car or component will function without failure using anticipated loads due to manufacturing, fatigue, corrosion, or accidental damage defects. DTA is very similar to FEA, except for one major thing. It assumes that there is initial flaw that went undetected during the manufacturing or qualification activity, such that it will then be the origin of a fatigue crack site resulting in the failure of the tank. The third method listed in the AIP, the Alternative Inspection Program, a federal regulation is the service reliability assessment and one that I'm very fond of. I think it provides a, at least an equal level of safety when compared with the other FEA and DTA and makes a, a very nice complement to the FEA practice, to the FEA analysis. And it is a way to determine the length of time a tank car or component will function without failure using systematically collected and analyzed in-service data. Remember a few slides ago, I said that those of you who are tank car owners and have turned over the 
uh, maintenance and management duties to a third party on your behalf, you are still responsible. And what we found early on in our interviews with tank car owners is that some of those folks who turned over those responsibilities were totally unaware that the management people were not collecting and analyzing the data to validate the intervals. And what they had to do was then go to the tank car facilities, the shops, and ask for the inspection forms to be pulled from the car files. In some cases, that data was available. In some cases, those records had been tossed. And as a result, analysis could not be performed, and those companies were in violation of the federal regulations, and their intervals were invalid. A little more about a finite analysis finite element analysis. It's a way to predict the stresses on a tank car component to ensure they will function without failure using defined loads. We went over that initially. Material properties, that's one area that we were keenly interested in, both at the DOT and the NTSB, because uh, NTSB's investigation has shown in this car uh, incident, as well as several others, the use of non-normalized steel in both ambient and low temperature cases is probably a risk, a very risky proposition. The FEA assumes no pre-existing defect, so all the time uh, that is consumed in the cycles that the car undergoes uh, in during the mileage uh, transitions in transportation, most of those cycles are used to create a fatigue crack. In other words, the cycles build up until at one time from a metallurgical standpoint, all of the voids, the micro voids in the material in the metal link up to form a fatigue crack. In most cases, it's estimated that the time to form the fatigue crack in an FEA is approximately 70 to 80% of the mileage of the car. FEA uses theoretical and or experimental data to estimate the miles, times, loads, and cycles, et cetera, to initiate cracks at fracture-sensitive locations, but may miss unanticipated hotspots. So, for example, if, if the car owner is looking only in the bottom eight feet of the car because that's what's shown in the regulations, they may miss an incident or an event that's occurring up around the manway because you know, during the original design, the analysts didn't predict that there would be high stresses at the top, maybe in the manway area or in the fittings housing area, which ultimately created cracks. Uh, this is another benefit of service reliability assessment we'll talk about in a moment. And it uses non-randomized loads sequenced in binned, in other words, groupings of loads of a certain load spectrum by load range. Inaccuracies occurred due to unaccounted for load excursions. And this is areas where the railroads may be very energetic in uh, handling of the tank cars. Here's an example of an FEA. Notice that the it's very difficult to see the hot spots on the, on the tank car. The blue regions, the cool regions are very low stress. The orange and red regions are the very high stress. This is of a particular tank car under frame design that did have a problem where that orange cell, that group of cells is located on the left side of the picture. Damage tolerance, we talked about this before. It's a way to determine the length of time a tank car component will function without failure in the presence of undetected manufacturing fatigue, corrosion, or accidental damage defects, which assumes a pre-existing defect of a defined type and size. It assumes also that that defect when, went undetected at the time of manufacturing or qualification. This DTA effort <clears throat> gained a lot of traction in the 90s when the AAR and some of the, I believe it was the RSI group at that time, um, formed the task force to, to see if DTA principles were applicable to calculating the inspection intervals for stub sills and stub sill structure. <clears throat> what they came away with was that the DTA that they were doing created too short of an interval for their liking. 
and the initial flaw size that was inferred to be present at that time, I believe was a quarter of an inch. Uh, Dexter Pasternak was the lead on that uh, effort. So basically the DTA effort in most cases was put on the shelf. It is useful. Uh, there is software out there where DTA can be incorporated in the FEA, uh, knowing some material properties, for example, the Sharpie toughness or K1C values of the material. But, uh, and I believe NASGRO is one of those software packages, but there is a, um, there could be a, a renewed effort if the industry chose to do so, to use these DTA in conjunction with service reliability assessment to come up with a fairly predictive interval for the qualification. Again, DTA uses the same non-randomized loads sequenced and binned by load range, and the inaccuracies occur here again due to unaccounted for load excursions. And here is a case, it's actually a larger version of what we showed you in the prior slide where there are hot spots in certain stub sill underframe designs, both in the stub sill uh, web and, and flange areas, as well as the stub sill reinforcement pad to the tank and the head brace locations. I'll talk a little bit more about DTA. DTA depends on the choice of analysis methods, depending on the thickness of the tank shell steel. You can use linear elastic fracture mechanics and develop K1C values. K1C is a, a basically it's a parameter of fracture toughness. Uh, it is a little bit broader than Sharpie values. Sharpie, there is a correlation factor between Sharpie and K1C. K1C de depends on the thickness of the material you're using. In most cases, if a car owner wanted to uh, invest itself in a K1C analysis, they would need to pull some K1C specimens apart. And we recommend that that be done at low temperatures and high strain rates, meaning uh, the pull rate is very rapid, unlike a, a tensile specimen, so that you can actually determine the, the uh, stress intensity factor, K1C, for that material. We view, we view K1C as being a, being a very worthwhile effort to do. It is, uh, it's involved, certainly, but it's a very worthwhile effort to do and it can be used effectively in collaboration with service reliability assessment. If the material is fairly uh, thin, uh, LEFM, linear elastic fracture mechanics, may not be the best choice and you'd have to transition to something called CTOD or the J integral approach. Failure occurs in this case when the local stress exceeds the K1C critical stress. By the way, the references in the footnotes here are ones that I rely on frequently and I relied on it during my tenure at GE to develop the first in the industry uh, alternative inspection program for tank car girth seam welds. So it's it was an effective tool and we also used SRA and I'll show that to you in a moment. Uh, DTA, cho the choice of analysis methods also depends on defect dimensions, location and orientation related to the material dimension. So if you have a shallow crack that may not be as applicable or useful, in a thick material as if the crack were propagated, let's say halfway through the tank shell thickness. Again, PODs are very critical to the use of the damage tolerance analysis tool because they will tell you what size flaw is reasonable to assume when undetected during the manufacturing or maintenance and qualification activity. Here again, Take a look at these are POD curves that were generated at Pueblo by some industry technician using industry procedures. And it's really not just the smallest crack you can detect, but the largest crack you can miss. All right. So that's that's the essence of the POD effort. You can see the lower crack that I have the yellow border around says there's a low detection probability, and that's the visual inspection method. Would everybody like a five minute break?
Thank you, Larry. Thank you, Larry. Yeah, I think yeah, that's a good idea. idea. Let's uh, let's take a five minute break. Um, folks can, um, if you have any questions, please you know take a moment, enter them in the chat, and uh, we will be back online at 11:42 uh, a.m. Eastern time. So see everybody in a little bit. Um, again, please put questions in the chat if you have any, and we will address them at the end of the presentation. All right, everybody, our uh, five minute uh, short break is up. So um, turn the presentation back over to Larry and uh, we'll talk about service reliability assessments and then uh, you know, kind of tie this all together to uh, you know, what owners need to do and how we can prevent this type of accident in the future. So uh, go ahead, Larry, thank you. Thanks, Eamon. So in the regulations, we use the phrase service reliability assessment, <clears throat> but we don't define it. We allude to it 
And it, the way we allude to it is by saying that it is systematically collected and analyzed data. We thought we would create a basic running definition of what a service reliability assessment is, and that is a way to determine the time a tank car or component will function without failure using systematically collected and analyzed in-service data, which, one, requires defining and codifying failure mechanisms and modes, critical crack size, detection capability, and status. By status, we mean whether a component has an observed failure or an, there is no failure, or at least no observed failure at that location. An SRA requires the creating a usage clock, which could be miles, times, loads, cycles, or what have you. In some cases, this is challenging for owners to develop. Uh, you'll remember that back in the day, when the SS2 forms originally came out, they asked for the accumulated mileage at the time the SS2 was conducted, and the um, uh, both that and the SS3 forms uh, were often missing that kind of information in there. Even though the the owners were held responsible for it, uh, they didn't have the the clocks, so to speak, to collect that type of information. Under the current federal regulations, they are responsible for collecting that type of information, whether it's miles or times or loaded moves or what have you. An SRA requires a data collection and analysis tools. And in this case, it would be something like a set of forms that would need to be filled out by the NDT technician or the inspector that imports all of the data from the inspection, including the procedure that was used, the equipment and materials used, for example, in penetrant, you would have to identify the type of penetrant materials, or in magnetic particle, you'd identify the type of powder that was used, whether it was wet or dry fluorescent or something of that nature. Uh, so all of that information needs to be present when you're conducting an SRA. And then requires setting reliability targets and goals. We'll talk more about that. What are some of the benefits of an SRA? Well, it uses actual in-service inspection and test results, not theoretical and experimental estimations. It discovers unanticipated hotspots. So for example, when an NDT technician climbs down the ladder inside the car to, uh, to do a UT on the girth seams, they may say see some distress up around the manway nozzle or up around the fittings housing nozzle, which is, is a key area now in the 117 style design cars and the 1232 design style cars. So uh, these unanticipated hotspots would need to be included in a service reliability assessment so that the owner of the car can inspect these locations on this design and similar design cars. SRAs provide reliability growth and reliability contribution opportunities. In other words, we, we spoke earlier about how the tank qualification decal on the side means that no, no weld on the bottom four feet of the tank for, for girth seam welds and longitudinal uh, seam welds or the bottom eight feet of the tank for fillet welds, none of those can be allowed to create a failure point during the interval on the qualification decal. And that's that's something that tends to be overlooked. Some people say, well, we're just gonna go for the lowest, the low hanging fruit, the one that's most troublesome. But in fact, if you do a series reliability analysis of all of the potential locations covered by the bottom of the tank shell regulation, there is a certain probability that any of them can fail in a in a given time during the qualification. So actually, we'll we'll show you some examples to roll that up to get a meaningful qualification interval. You have to multiply the reliabilities of all of those locations to come up with the actual reliability interval. SRAs also drive NDT selection and improvement. They set the post-construction inspe inspection and test frequencies. Remember, that was a key finding in the NTSB report and also the FAA 
observation that the intervals in most cases need to be shorter, not longer, because the NDT methods used or the, the skill of the operators were not adequate to find uh, pre-existing cracks. What are some of the challenges of SRA? One, defining the critical crack size. Two, achieving accurate NDT detection and sensitivity and reliability values. In other words, the owner needs to specify what level of NDT POD they demand for performing the inspections on their cars. Historically, a 9095 POD has been selected. And this comes from NASA and some mill handbook uh, values that were promulgated in the 60s and 70s, uh, Ward Rummel, who happens to be, we call him the father of POD, he's still active in ASNT, American Society for Non-Destructive Testing. He was basically the person who suggested this statistical value to NASA, and they then used it in the design and development of a number of fracture-controlled structures in the, uh, the space flight program. Meeting reliability targets and goals by predicting that less than one car will fail during the qualification interval. We call that the one car principle. And also all of the challenges that an owner faces using an SRA and, and making sure their, uh, their tank cars are structurally sound and, and pose low risk to operation and to the public, they must maintain the railworthiness of the cars. What is railworthiness? Well, here again, there is a definition in 18509, excuse me, 49 CFR 18503 in this case, the tank service equipment, safety systems, and all other components, one, conform to the hazardous materials regulations, two, are otherwise suitable for continued service. And this is where pre existing cracks in high stress locations on a tank car that's manufactured from low toughness steel, such as non-normalized TC-128, would probably pose a risk that if the owners knew about the risk, they would be, oh, I would say, probably not inclined to continue using without some type of repair. And three, are capable of performing their intended function until their next qualification. Here's how to develop a service reliability assessment program. The, the roadmap is already laid out for us in M1002 Appendix U. M1002 meaning the tank car manual or the manual standards and recommended practices. Some people call it C3, we like to call it M1002. It's already been laid out for you due to some the efforts of some folks in the audience today they laid it all out for you. It talks about reliability. It talks about selecting reliability goals and a number of other factors that are necessary to create an effective SRA program to meet federal regulations and also to keep the American public safe. What are some of the steps in an, for the data collection and reliability analysis? Well, one, the owners must designate the fracture sensitive inspection locations. And that's also shown on the new TCID templates, isn't it? Two, specify the appropriate NDT methods and techniques and PODs. This is what the owner is required to do. The owner in this case may select PODs that the tank car facility has demonstrated they can meet. This all depends on the owner's risk appetite. If the owner wants to select a very low POD, that's up to them. But if one incident, one tank car fails and creates a hazmat release in an incident, FRA will be on your doorstep asking to demonstrate why the other cars shouldn't be welded to the rails. Three, identify failure modes in the acceptance criteria. What we talk about here in acceptance criteria is not necessarily the actual fracture of the tank completely through the shell such that it releases commodity, but these would be some precursor failure definitions that the owner would need to identify. Four, develop inspection and test forms and collect POD-based data. Here again, the data that you collect is what we would say in the computer industry, garbage in, garbage out. 
If you have low PODs for your inspection capabilities, the data that you're going to, to accumulate is not going to be very meaningful and reflective of the actual number of flaws and their length and size and risk to the fleet uh, that you're going that you would want to use in your analysis. And five, establish a usage hitch history. This is where the owners have to come up with what type of a clock they want to use. Whether it's miles, hours, days, years, number of loaded or empty moves or a combination of both, cycles, number of openings and closings of manway covers or openings and closings of valves, and et cetera. Let's go through each one of these briefly. Uh, designate the fracture sensitive inspection locations. The TCID templates do a nice job for us. Some of these were derived from GE templates that I was proud to work on. They identify some cases where they are both known and unknown uh, locations on a tank car. For example, the A10, the top of the bolster horn there, the bolster reinforcement pad horn, that's not really listed in the federal regulations, but has been shown to be a hot spot on certain underframe designs. So uh, it's always better to, to have more locations in your data analysis set rather than fewer. And the A6 welds, in this case, it's a design very similar to the ACF 200, where you have terminations of the longitudinal fillets at the inboard uh, transition or transfer weld, uh, the transverse weld between the two sides of the A6 locations. Two, select appropriate NDT methods, techniques, and PODs. So as this is this is another graph, it's the same graph we used previously. In this case, with industry personnel using industry procedures, visual inspection was deemed to be a pretty, have a pretty low probability of detection for the size flaws that were actually created doing, during a fatigue test experiment at TTCI. So you had industry technicians using industry procedures trying to detect TTCI generated flaws in uh, locations that were fairly representative of the underframe designs. Here you can see where in this case there were some pads welded to the bottom of the tank shell. Uh, this particular experiment used both the, uh, it used a clamshell design that was both open and then was fairly um, covered in certain locations to, to test people's ability to find the cracks when the location of the area to detect was somewhat obscured. Here's another case where the owner must identify the failure modes and acceptance criteria. For example, when a one inch long crack at the inboard stub sill reinforcement pad on an, an ACF 200 A6 design, would that be a case of a, would the owner call that a failure? In my estimation, the owner would definitely want to call that a failure when they plug it into their reliability analysis. By the way, and we'll talk about it in a minute, you can do reliability analysis with statistics either manually or with software. Manual takes days and weeks of time to do it and then to integrate all of the results that you get. Software makes a much easier um, road to hoe for coming up with some meaningful values. And it also helps you steer clear of what may be useless information that wouldn't add value to your analysis or to the inspection uh, capability discussion. Would an owner call a two and a quarter inch long crack at a break bracket to tank weld a failure? In my experience, the, the owner would definitely want to call a two and a quarter inch long crack at a break bracket weld a failure, even though it didn't propagate completely through the tank at the time of the inspection. Why? Because with only a slight increase in the stress at that location, it could cause that fatigue crack to propagate completely through the tank, resulting in a tank shell leak. And in this case, with the picture on the left, it did result in a tank shell breach. So what 
considerations do owners need to be aware of? Well, first of all, that the critical crack size POD. In other words, the owner must come up with a critical crack size, the size they want found at a highly reliable level of sensitivity. If the owner defined critical crack size probability of detection is less than the owner specified probability of detection capability that the shop has, that the tank car facility demonstrates, it could invalidate the entire service reliability assessment model that the owner submits to FRA to, to get either a longer or in some ways a modified uh, inspection threshold, let's put it that way. In this example that you see before you, this is all hypothetical data, but it, it includes considerations the owner must be aware of. For example, what's the failure length at a particular location on the car? Is that failure length the same for all locations on the car that are regulated uh, by 49 CFR 179 and 180? No. There are different failure lengths that can occur at different locations on the car. But here again, the owner must bundle all of his reliability analyses together to demonstrate that no, none of those locations, no place on the regulated bottom of the tank will fail during the qualification interval. In this case, the green line shows that the applied stress is variable. And in some cases, it could exceed values that could then create an extension of the fatigue crack resulting in ultimate failure of the, um, it, it'll achieve the failure length resulting in the ultimate failure of the tank at that location. And, and then of course there's the POD. In this case with the fatigue crack shown in red, the POD that in this hypothetical example that we used has a very low probability of detection, probably 40% or so, at the failure length that we projected in this hypothetical analysis. Here's an example of some test forms that were developed. This is what the owner needs to create to collect the data that's going to be subsequently analyzed. Can the owner's delegate and contract with a third party to develop these forms and collect the data? Absolutely yes. But it's with both the owner's permission that the shop would use these forms and with the developer of these forms permission to the owner to make sure that the, the developer allows these forms to be used by the owner. So it's a two-way street. In some cases, tank car facilities have already developed these forms to be used in conjunction with their own NDT procedures, which the owner then allows the tank car facility to use to detect the cracks. In 18509, it states the owner must ensure that the tank car facility is complying with the procedures used to qualify its cars. In most cases, this is done through an audit uh, program that the owner imposes on the tank car facility. So the tank car owner may send an auditor in to be sure that the tank car facility is both using these forms and measuring the flaws that the facility is finding using the NDT methods that the owner has approved of, okay? So we want to be clear, and this is something that FRA goes in and asks for very frequently during our, our audits of tank car facilities. Show us what procedures and forms you're using and show us the owner's written permission allowing you to use these forms and procedures, okay? In some cases, shippers take it upon themselves to send the tank cars into facilities that can do the work and have agreed to bill the shipper for the work, but the owner has no knowledge that the tank car is in a facility for the work to be performed. This is a violation of the federal regulations, and if we discover it, we can ask that all of the tank cars so modified or repaired and qualified in this manner be pulled back and inspected and tested using the owner-approved qualification program. Here's another example of some additional line items on the test forms. 
An example this is old school, but this is a case where the tank car facilities would write down the length of the cracks they found at certain locations, and that information could be imported into a statistics package, a reliability package that then allowed them to generate reliability curves that we'll see in a moment. So the owner must identify and classify actual or potential failures and suspensions based on failure modes. At GE, we had different failure modes depending on where the crack was found. For example, a crack in the base metal was a BM crack, so to speak. A crack in the throat of the weld was a weld crack, a crack in the uh, base metal of the adjacent reinforcement plate also had a particular um, classification, and I, I can't remember what it is. I think it's the, uh, it's not parent metal, but it's the reinforcement plate crack. In other words, depending on where the crack was situated, the tank car facilities gave it a different uh, failure mode classification so that we could generate uh, meaningful results for where the cracks were appearing most frequently to be sure that the tanks, any cracks in the tank shell were actually addressed comprehensively uh, as opposed to tack cracks that may be in the leg of the fillet weld that was in the reinforcement plate that may not be as severe. The owner must then tally actual and potential failures and suspensions, suspensions meaning non-failed locations on whatever the clock is, miles, times, loads, and cycles, and then stratify the actual or potential failure modes by, by whatever the clock is, times, miles, loads, or cycles. For example, an owner might be finding a high frequency of cracks that are occurring in the reinforcement plate side of the fillet weld, the toe of the fillet weld on the reinforcement plate. While that is a significant location, it may not have the same gravity as, as cracks found in the parent metal right at the toe of the fillet weld between the uh, fillet and the tank shell. This would have significantly higher risk and higher consequence, and it might be something that the owner wants to accelerate the inspection interval on based on that failure mode. Here's an example of a reliability diagram using the software we use here at FRA. It's software I first found and uh, learned about at GE. It's called ReliaSoft. It can generate these graphs for you in a fairly uh, short amount of time. It, it plots the reliabilities for each rational subgroup. So for example, you can plot them for A1 welds, A6 welds, A10 welds that we saw was the bolster horn. Uh, it can, if you stratify the data properly to show that each of those locations has a different reliability or may have a different reliability, you can come up with the total reliability package to generate your reliability goals and ultimately your qualification interval. You can set the reliability targets and goals, including the safety margin or the B value using the one car principle. We'll speak about that shortly. And then set the qualification intervals based on the reliability targets and values and the one car principle. So for example, the weld in the light green section up there has a very high reliability up to, and it's difficult to read, probably 13 years, something like that. So does the light blue weld location. The black weld location, however, <clears throat> uh, has a substantially even greater uh, life as, it, uh, as the time progresses dropping down to only 96% at a time interval of probably 15 years as I read the, the graph. So the black one has the highest reliability with time, the blue one an intermediate reliability, and the green one seems to do pretty well for 12 years and kind of falls off the edge of the earth, doesn't it? Here's an example that, of a situation that we were speaking of earlier where the qualification interval 
addresses not just the least reliable weld on the car, the structural integrity of the least reliable weld, but that you must multiply all of the welds that are in the inspection location, the regulated inspection location, which is the bottom four feet of the tank for uh, seam welds, butt welds, and the bottom eight feet of the tank for the longitudinal terminations of fillet welds quarter inch and greater, excuse me, greater than quarter inch, and the transition welds and the transverse fillets that of quarter in, greater than a quarter inch uh, that run anywhere in the bottom eight feet of the tank car, the shell. So in this case, we have four different weld types that we're analyzing. The upper left graph shows a, a very reliable weld at the 365-day point, one year. It's about 0.99, I would say. The upper right example is a little, probably about the same, probably 0.99 at the same value. They're a little difficult to read here on the, uh, on the chart, uh, but I'll, I'll give you the best rendition I have. The weld on the lower left section is has a reliability of 1.00. That means it is perfectly reliable at one year's time. No failures were recorded in any of the collected data, as well as the suspensions. Remember, reliability covers not just the failed locations, but suspension data as well. Suspension means no failures. And then the lower right example the lower right graph is a is a reliability of approximately 0.91 at a one year interval so multiplied together multiplied by 100 after that gives us what an 89 percent reliability that none of those welds will fail at a one year time period but what does that also mean to us? It means that 11% of the cars will have failed at that point in time. Again, what failure means to an owner may be different than what failure means to the FRA. Failure to the FRA means complete breach of the tank that's releasing commodity and posing a risk to the public. The risk to the owner may be substantially reduced if they create a larger safety margin between what they term to be failure, meaning a precursor event or a potential failure, and an actual failure. Bear that in mind. Now, what happens at the two-year interval? Well, if, a, if we carry this out to the two-year point, we look at what the reliabilities are for those same four weld locations, and we have a 0.88, multiplied times 6.67 times 0.96 times 0.73 times 100 equals a 41 percent reliability meaning none of the cars will have a weld that meets the failure definition uh 41 percent of the cars will not have a weld that meets the failure definition after two years but 59 percent of the cars will at one or more of the locations covered by these graphs, these charts. So what does that mean? Well, basically six out of 10 tank cars will have a weld that could be injurious to the future of the tank and impose a risk to both the owner and the, the safety of the public. So what we suggest is, and we'll show you in the next slide, we, we want to make sure that the owners understand that they must identify what to inspect, and it's in the regulations, where to inspect, how to inspect, that they identify the acceptance criteria, meaning that they define what failure means to them. It could be a, it could be a crack that's a quarter of an inch long, barely detectable using the NDT methods that they prescribe in their qualification and maintenance program. That would provide a large safety ma margin to the public, wouldn't it? If they define failure as being a crack that's one inch or more, that poses a risk to the public and one that both NTSB data and FRA data has shown would be, could be very injurious 
for the car to continue in service and thus not remain railworthy. The owner must collect and, and analyze inspection and test data. They must validate the qualification intervals to prevent failure, whether it's precursor failure or potential failure or actual failure. It doesn't matter to us except that you have to prevent, the owner has to prevent any release of product and that's what that qualification decal is intended to mean and that they revise the intervals if necessary. Now I mentioned that one owner, actually several owners that I've been in contact with, have reduced the intervals for service equipment and interior rubber linings <clears throat> based on the service reliability analysis that they have performed. <clears throat> I'm not aware that many owners have reduced the tank qualification interval, but they probably should based on this event, the new Martinsville event, and that A6 location on both the ACF 200 and other crack prone under frame designs. What's required of facilities? Well, the facility at minimum must embed the owner's qualification and maintenance program in its quali quality assurance program regulated by 179.7 to ensure that the finished product conforms to the requirements of the applicable specification and regulations of the subchapter Two, has the means to detect any nonconformity in the manufacturing, repair, inspection, testing, and qualification or maintenance program of the tank car. And three, this is one of the most important regulations in the entire 180 subpart F section from our standpoint, prevents nonconformities from recurring. In other words, as troublesome as it may be, to have an incident occur such as occurred in New Martinsville, the owner must take steps and the facility must follow the owner's program to ensure that nonconformities do not recur. Here 18501B says the, uh, own, the facility must incorporate the owner's QMPs into its own quality assurance program. And what does that mean? That means the facility must train its personnel on the owner's qualification and maintenance programs, whether those are classroom trainings or toolbox sessions. Either way, it means that the tank car facilities must receive training on the owner qualification and maintenance procedures. We audit for that. We have written numerous violations for failure to give us records that demonstrate that. The tank car facility must have procedures for evaluating the inspection and test technique employed, including the accessibility of the area and the sensitivity and reliability of the inspection and test technique and minimum detectable crack length. <clears throat> for example, the, owner the facility must demonstrate it can detect the owner-defined defects at the owner-defined probabilities of detection levels, which may fail the tank before the next qualification using the owner approved NDT procedures and facility and or subcontractor personnel. <clears throat> In other words, if the owner defines a probability of detection at 90-95 and through experiment, the facility and its personnel or subcontractor, person, subcontractor personnel used by the facility demonstrate that only they can only meet a 30% probability of detection using that NDT method, they have violated the regulation. We have seen in some of our audits where facilities use the data that was generated by the Pueblo TTCI experiments as their own data. In other words, they want to use the data that was included in the FRA TTCI inspection report, the POD reports, as their own data. This is a violation because unless their personnel actually went out to TTCI and performed those inspections using their procedures, their equipment, and their personnel, they cannot take advantage of the TTCI data to demonstrate compliance with the owner's qualification and maintenance program. Bear that in mind. If your 
maintenance provider. If you're a tent car owner and you hire a maintenance company to do the work and they give you procedures that they wrote and it references the TTCI FRA report and they didn't send their people out to validate those capabilities, they're in violation of the regulation and that can result in you having to recall your cars qualified using those uh, unapproved procedures and that could be very troublesome, not to mention uh, invite a lot of risk to your company and to the safety of the public. In summary, our recommendation, uh, our response to the NTSB recommendation is this. One, establish and validate structural integrity inspection frequency by either a finite analysis, finite element analysis, which is listed in the regulations and probably is a good starting point along with a damage tolerance analysis backed up by a service reliability assessment. We feel the SRA is probably more than 50% of the, of the value to an owner for demonstrating compliance with the regulation because the SRA is using the actual in-service inspection data to identify the hot spots on the car and what the probability of cracks appearing in those areas, the length of those cracks and their probability of resulting in a complete tank shell failure and release. Two, provide guidance for defining critical flaw size and repair and acceptance criteria for indications in fracture sensitive locations by, again, a finite element analysis. It's good, uh, a damage tolerance analysis, a little bit better because it assumes an initial flaw that went undetected and or a service reliability assessment. We term that the best approach. And three, in order to respond to the NTSB, we recommend that the owner provide guidance for selecting the NDT methods to identify cracks with a sufficient probability of detection by one using a POD analysis. Now, when we've spoken about this topic to the industry in prior events and prior conferences, some of the industry pushback has focused around the effort needed, the effort expended to conduct a full POD analysis. As an owner, I would want a full POD analysis to be performed to not only identify the smallest crack that can be found at a particular level of reliability, but the largest cracks that can go undetected at those locations. So for example, if I can find a let's say a 0.7 inch crack, which happened to be the size that resulted in the failure in this car. If a 0.7 inch crack on the uh, bottom of the tank at the A6 location had an 80% probability of detection, but a one inch crack had a, oh, let's see, a very low probability of detection at that same location, I might want to strive for a higher probability of detection at that 0.7 interval, wouldn't I? To make sure that large cracks did not go completely undetected. And in some of the graphs that we showed that large cracks only achieved 90 or greater percent uh, probability of detection when they grew to a fairly substantial length of four inches or more. NTSB reports and some other industry and regulatory reports show that cracks three inches and greater can almost universally result in a complete tank shell failure and release of hazardous materials. So um, we are suggesting to the industry, and that's why we are holding this, this presentation to Maybe if your qualification and maintenance program isn't where you'd like to see it based on the information provided today, that you kind of step up your game and engage in some of these activities. By the way, the full POD analysis can be labor intensive and time consuming. 
FRA also provided a less onerous POD analysis uh, process technique using the 29 out of 29 experiment that ASME identifies in Section 5, Article 14. That is of fairly limited scope, however, because you have to use the exactly uh, the exact same size flaw uh, in 29 out of 29 locations and have at least three times as many unflawed areas to have a valid POD experiment. We did allow it in Railworthiness Directive 1601. Some companies met that POD using that analysis technique. But as an owner, I want to know not only what's the smallest flaw I can find with using the NDT method I specify, but what's the largest flaw that I can miss at a particular POD. So it's all in risk mitigation for a large fleet owner and any owner of tank cars that transport PIH, TIH material. And thank you for your attention, and we invite questions at this time. Excellent. Excellent. Thank, thank you, Larry. Larry. Um, if uh, you're ready, if you're we ready, can. We uh, we've can got, got a few got questions, a questions from the audience, the audience that we can, we can roll, into. roll into. Let's go to that. Okay. So, uh, first question uh, came from a couple folks. Said, uh, "Will you be distributing a copy of the presentation to the group?" Uh, we do plan to share a, the recording that, uh, of the presentation that uh, you just watched, uh, but I don't think we are going to be sharing the actual presentation. Um, Larry and I uh, might discuss that offline, but at this point, I think we're just going to be sharing uh, the recording. So next question. Okay, uh, with this particular car, did the car owner establish a structural inspection interval? And if so, what was it? Also, was there reliability data to back it up? Uh, I assume that, that we're talking about the um, new Martinsville car. So, Larry, if you have information about that that, that you can share, go ahead. Um, I'm also, you know, cognizant that there's, you know, there's ongoing legal issues surrounding that release, so we might not be able to speak about it too much. But, uh, but Larry, if you have something you'd like to share, go ahead. Uh, thanks, Eamon. We, we noted in the NTSB report that the uh, pre-existing flaw size was approximately 0.7 inches and in, they call it width in the report with about a 0.3 depth through the uh, into the tank shell material. Uh, we, yeah, we probably can't comment on whether there was any SRA data available. The value of the qualification interval was the regulatory maximum of 10 years at that time, which um, since the event occurred in 2016 and the car had been qualified in 2016, may have uh, not benefited from all of the requirements of Part 180. Excellent. Um, okay, next question. Uh, it says, I may have misunderstood what Mr. Strauss said about the qualification sense on the car. Does FRA deem that a failure means that the component met the reliability standard only if there was a release? Uh, so, Larry, I believe you did speak about this a little bit, kind of talking about the two different kinds of failure, uh, you know, the, the owner's definition of failure and FRA's definition of failure. But if you'd like to speak on that a little more, uh, go ahead. Thanks, Heyman. The FRA def definition of failure, which we are tracking through a new initiative within the Office of uh, Railroad Safety in the Hazmat Division, is we're tracking all hazmat releases, whether they come from service equipment or failed tanks due to structural defects or interior coatings and linings and corrosion. So in our world, failure means an actual breach of the tank that results in release of the product. For the owner, I think what we talked about earlier is that you want to uh, set up a failure definition in your statistics analysis and your reliability analysis where you include enough safety margin so that the potential failure does not encroach 
on the actual failure margin, okay, with the location. So for example, if my critical crack size that I deem to be one inch uh, that I know can result in lots of risk being assumed by my company due to breaches in the tank, I'm probably not going to want to define failure as 0.9 inches, meaning there's very little safety margin uh, for the development of my qualification interval. So to sum it up, FRA defines failure just as a release of the uh, commodity. But if the tank does fail, you, fail, we're going to ask you for all your data that you used to come up with a valid qualification interval that will prevent the tank from failing. Releasing product. Let me phrase it that way. Excellent. Okay, uh, next question here. Uh, so when looking at part 180, uh, does failure only apply to the tank and its appurtenances? Uh, what about those items covered by freight car safety standards, safety appliance and or power brake? Good question. <clears throat> The reliability discussion that we've uh, presented today covers only those items presented in 180 subpart F, meaning the tank, keeping the product in the tank, as my colleague Randy Kelts would say. It only addresses that. Reliability methods and tools can definitely be used for analysis of the other features of a tank car, such as wheels and axles, uh, draft gears, you know, follower blocks, things of that nature. Having said that, however, it's not limited to the welds though. It does cover, remember, there are other features of the tank car that are covered by, by part 180, uh, such as the safety systems such as interior coatings and linings. So these components and these features of the tank must or can also be addressed by a service reliability assessment. If an owner submits an, an SRA application to the FRA requesting carte blanche extension of intervals for all of the items, such as service equipment, safety systems, tank, thickness testing, they will have to demonstrate that all of the elements meet the interval that they are uh, requesting relief for. That means the thermal protection cannot fail in that interval. It means that cracks behind the horn on couplers, on double shelf couplers cannot fail during that interval. Uh, it means that bolts can't corrode out causing valves to fall off the car during that interval. You can see all of the items that are addressed in 180.509. Great, thank you, Larry. Okay, another question here. Um, so I think these next few questions were from the uh, end of the presentation. Uh, so the question is, what if the tank car owner was part of the TTCI FRA probability of detection study and supplies those procedures to the tank car facility? Does the tank car facility need to prove they can meet the reliability and sensitivity stated within the procedure provided by the owner? Good question. The answer is yes, their technicians must demonstrate that they have the capability to meet the PODs required by the car owner in their qualification and maintenance program. Can it be done in a uh, timely fashion? Yes. Technician capability can be demonstrated using a 2929 experiment or some other abbreviated POD validation experiment. That would be up to the owner to specify and approve and the facility to conduct using their technicians. Thank you. Okay, next question. Uh, if a company produces a probability of detection on a given procedure, 
is that POD then attached to the procedure or to the company? For example, company X creates a procedure and performs a POD with its personnel. Can that procedure then be used and assumed to be correct at company Y that company X wants the work to be performed at? Good question. Again, the answer to that is the procedure cannot be transported to another company without its technicians demonstrating their capability to meet the owner's acceptance criteria. Great. Okay, next question. Uh, should tank car owners request documentation from repair facilities showing where those facilities train their employees to the tank car owner specific procedures as a means of objective evidence? The answer to that one is yes. The 18509, I believe it's A1, says that the owners shall ensure that the tank car facilities are complying with their qualification and maintenance programs. Therefore, training is one element, and that occurs in 179.7D, I believe it is, that the facility must train its people on the owner's program and procedures. So if I was a tank car owner, I would certainly want to make sure as part of my obligation to maintain the integrity of my fleet that the facilities where I'm having the work done is training their people to meet my requirements. The, uh, the other aspect of that is that if people are not complying with my procedures as a car owner, I need to find that out in a timely fashion. Or if if I'm allowing, here's another hypothetical, if I'm allowing a number of different qualification and maintenance programs to be used on my cars, for example, shop A, shop B, and shop C all have different procedures. I'm going to have to reconcile the results that have been obtained with those three different sets of procedures to come up with my service reliability assessment. Otherwise, I'm confounding the data. In other words, one procedure may not be able to find a POD that's three inches long, whereas another facility might be able to find one that's half an inch long. So as an owner, I want to make sure that my data is consistent and repeatable and reproducible before I attempt to create a service reliability assessment. So we've got a, it looks like a follow-up to that question. So uh, sorry, I'm gonna, gonna skip to the most recent question we just got. Um, so historically, the probability of detection was attached to the reliability and sensitivity of the procedure and not the technician. Based on your answers, the technicians are now part of the reliability and sensitivity. Are you implying that every technician at a tank car facility is required to meet a required POD for each method they are certified to? Yes, that's what FRA is saying. That's what I am saying. Much like a welder, where we, the case of the welder is a prime example. Every welder in a certified tank car facility who welds on tank cars and tank car shells and components attached to the tank by welding must demonstrate their capability through a, an abbreviated test plate. This is, this, this is an analogous situation to welder qualification. In 179.7, and I believe it's B6, the inspector must demonstrate, perhaps B7, the, the inspector must demonstrate that they can meet the owner's acceptance criteria. So the, the technician who's performing the work on the car must demonstrate that they can meet the owner's uh, POD at a particular critical crack size in order to prove to me as the owner and to the industry that they have the capability to find the flaws that we deem to be injurious to the tank. 18511 says that the tank qualification activity must find defects that are that will initiate or propagate cracks to failure of the tank. 
So the only way to do that is by performance demonstration of the technicians who perform that work. So does that mean that subcontractor personnel would need to find to de, uh, to prove that as well? And the answer to that is yes. So if you're getting a a third party subcontractor in who's performing UT or penetrant, you would need to have some samples on hand that they that prove to you that they can detect the flaws that the owner is interested in detecting at a particular level of POD. Again, we the industry has been offered the opportunity to create less time consuming POD experiments by using 29, 29 or seven out of seven um, experiments that ASME uses in their section five, article 14 endeavor. So it doesn't have to be a long time consuming expensive effort to demonstrate that technicians have the proper level of uh, inspection capability. Thank you, Larry. Uh, excellent answer. Okay, uh, two more questions here. And, uh, you know, again, I know we're, we're slightly over our time. I really appreciate everyone's patience. If you have any additional questions, uh, please uh, feel free to keep uh, put, putting them in the chat. Um, okay, uh, so this question is, uh, any comments on the probability of detection model based on NDT method? Uh, versus an amplitude-based base model that may be better suited to certain methods and hit or miss better suited for others. Any comments or thoughts on models working better for certain methods than others? They, let's see if I understand the question. Are certain methods better for certain types of flaws at certain locations? My feeling on that as a level three is definitely yes. Uh, one of the topics we discussed early on was that some of the cracks at the inboard fillet weld terminations weld under uh, run underneath the stub sill reinforcement pad. And it would require possibly ultrasonic testing from inside the tank to discover those or possibly after excavation, uh, mag particle or penetrant usage to see if or how far they run underneath the pad. If the question is, do we favor the A hat versus A model of POD versus the hit or miss model? Uh, at this time, we prefer the hit miss model rather than trying to come up with the actual length of the flaw detected, only because it's less, it's less involved. The, we're, we're trying to incent the industry to do the right thing using the hit-miss model, where they detect the crack being there and don't worry about it being uh, about the length of it. When we proceed into a full damage tolerance assessment uh, model, this is when it becomes beneficial to try and estimate what the flaw size actually is. We have not seen, here at FRA, we have not seen an application for a DTA-based model for an alternative inspection program. It has all been based on hit miss data, and we continue to favor that approach. <laughs> We're lucky to get them to do the hit miss. Uh, and so that's what we're trying to incent the industry to follow. Thank you for uh, helping me uh, translate there, Larry. I think I, I did butcher the question, but I think you got it. Uh, no, no, I, I got it. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, it's the, um, okay. It's the standard uh, tension between hit miss and and uh, uh, a hat a hat versus a. Okay, another question here. Uh, thoughts or comments on using model assisted uh, POD methodology to supplement 
uh, POD analysis since standards do not exist for model-assisted uh, POD techniques? Yes, uh, model-assisted POD or MAPOD as it's called in some locations was an initiative uh, created at the Iowa State NDE Center by Bruce Thompson. It has gained a little bit of traction and probably could benefit from additional um, funding and research to come up with a better, better software, I guess would be the way to phrase it, to come up with a more reliable software tool to use for uh, the analysis. Right now, because when uh, Bruce Thompson left the project, it kind of foundered for lack of an owner. And if the industry or if one of the regulatory agencies wanted to continue to sponsor it, we think it would be a worthwhile uh, venture. Thank you, Larry. OK, this is right now our final question uh, that we have. And it um, I think it's, a, again, a bit of a follow up to our discussion of uh, tank car facilities and the requirements for technicians performing non-destructive testing. Um, the question is, so each technician will need to demonstrate for each owner's procedure and each process for which they are certified uh, that they may follow at the repair shop? Good question. Yes, the answer to that is yes. What I present to the owners and the facilities that we visit Think of it as analogous to the welding certifications that are conducted today. The NDT inspections and tests are no different, except you're not dealing with liquid metal. Um, the people for the industry to have confidence that the cracks that could injure the public and, and fail the tank have been detected the, Depends upon treating the uh, depends upon treating NDT as an inspection system. The inspection system comprises of the the technique, the principles of the method or technique, the equipment used, and the skills of the operator. When a particular NDT method and technique changes some of those parameters which are defined in the Appendix T right now as essential variables, requalification of that NDT procedure or technique is necessary. So it's, a, it's almost the duplicate scenario to welding. And in welding, we require that every welder who uses a specific process, such as an NDT method, you know, just like an NDT method, can differ. We require in welding that every welder prove their skills and capability by welding test plates with that process. The same holds true for NDT technicians. In the regulations, it says the, op the people doing the work must meet the owner's acceptance criteria. So they must demonstrate they can achieve the POD specified by the owner and the defined critical crack size that the owner wants to find. Awesome, thank you, Larry. Um, one more question on this, um, sort of a general question. Uh, will there be additional webinars uh, provided going forward? So great question. Uh, we don't have any uh, definite plans uh, for additional webinars on this topic or related topics moving forward, but uh, that's not to say that there won't be. Uh, that's very much something that's, uh, you know, kind of being discussed, you know, as we, uh, you know, uh, activities, you know, going out into the field while in many ways are coming back. We're still trying to kind of figure out how outreach and engagement is going to continue, uh, you know, during the maximum telework time and additional webinars on these topics and, and related ones are absolutely on the table. And the folks who have registered, um, you know, the folks who registered for this meeting, you'll absolutely you know, be on lists now uh, if you want to be contacted for future webinars or things like that. So, um, you know, stay tuned. I don't have anything uh, specific to share. Uh, okay. 
I mean, it's also possible that this or a similar presentation might be offered at another industry meeting, like a tank car committee meeting or what have you. Oh, absolutely. So, you know, to the industry, stay tuned. Absolutely. Okay, uh, looks like we've got one more question on uh, NDT technicians. So, Larry, I'll, I'll give we'll give we'll do this one more question, and then I think we can, uh, you know, we'll provide a little opportunity for you to do a wrap up. Does that sound good? Sounds great. Okay. So, uh, since all NDT technicians are required to perform testing and uh, on-the-job training prior to certification, will the practical that is performed on each technician meet the objective evidence similar to a welder proving their capabilities? Let's see if I understand this, the practical that's presented. The practical listed in Appendix T is more for it's basically a, a shortcut method for validating POD than it is operator capability. So what I would say is that the level of skill, the level of demonstrated skill required of a technician must be stated by the owner and must be demonstrated by the tank car facility through the development of a procedure for evaluating the operator's skill. Uh, we mentioned the 2929 experiment. Uh, if you look at ASME section five, non-destructive evaluation, article 14, they show what the different non-parametric binomial values would be. For example, seven out of seven, I believe is a 90% POD at 50% confidence that uh, an owner could accept as their level of, of capability or the level of capability they require for uh, facility personnel to achieve. The Appendix T performance, or actually it's a performance demonstration is really geared toward it's a shortcut method for achieving pod and doesn't really meet the reliability and sensitivity requirements listed in the regulations so i would say that that appendix t performance demonstration is not an alternate to performing a a higher level of um, oversight and scrutiny in evaluating technician capability but here again, to the industry, it's all defined in the owner's qualification and maintenance program. If they want to rely on a two out of two experiment, which is a much lower level of reliability of operator capability, that's up to them. But should they have a catastrophic release, FRA will call upon them to prove or to at least convince us that more cars are not affected. So I think you would be want to be armed as an owner. I would want to be armed with more reliability and more data rather than less. Excellent. Thank you, Larry. And um, so we're coming to the end of our time here. Uh, any concluding thoughts or anything you want to leave everyone with? In summary, to answer the NTSB recommendation, uh, we agree, FRA and FEMSA agree that more needs to be done in the area of detecting pre-existing cracks, either through finite element analysis, damage tolerance analysis, or my preferred and FRA's um, currently requested approach, service reliability assessment. This is actually where the rubber meets the road. The SRA also depends on a properly constructed uh, probability of detection experiment to prove that the data that's included in an SRA assessment is valid. A low probability of detection which can't find cracks of a significant level which have shown to cause problems in the industry 
would not be acceptable to us and we would not uh, we would not accept it in an application for an AIP alternative inspection program. So what we're saying is uh, now that the industry has the knowledge about what to do, they should probably step up their game because we have already asked for the data and the procedures to demonstrate the reliability and the probabilities of detection. Excellent. Thank you, Larry. Um, I'll leave everyone. Uh, so, you know, I'm not an engineer. I'm not a lawyer. I, I work for standards. So I always go back to the regulations and I'd like to leave everyone with the uh, from section 18511 paragraph B, acceptable results of inspections and tests. The acceptable result of a structural integrity inspection and test is that a tank car successfully passes the structural integrity inspection and test when it shows no structural defect that may initiate cracks or propagate cracks and cause failure of the tank before the next inspection and test interval. That's what all this comes back to. You know, that's what this presentation today is about. That's what this NTSB recommendation is about, is how we can work towards making sure that nothing that is going to cause a failure of that tank, you know, makes it through an inspection interval. So just want to really thank everyone for your time and attention and uh, for your commitment to safety and, uh, Hope everyone stays well. Thank you all. Thanks, everyone.